everyone. Thank you so much for joining us joining us tonight. My name is Rosemary Hall, and on behalf of the Catholic Information Center and our director, Father Charles Trulos, it is my pleasure to welcome everyone here this evening in person and online and to introduce Father Roger Landry, author of Plan of Life, Habits to Help You Grow Closer to God. Father Landry works for the Holy See's Permanent Observer Mission to the United Nations in New York. He is also the New York City Leonine Forum Chaplain. After his studies at Harvard College and the Pontifical North American College in Rome, Father Landry served as pastor at several parishes throughout the years and was former executive editor of The Anchor, the weekly newspaper of the Diocese of Falls River. Father Landry has also appeared on various Catholic radio programs and is the national chaplain for Catholic Voices USA. He lectures widely on the thought of Pope Francis, Benedict, and John Paul II, and writes for many Catholic publications. He also leads pilgrimages and retreats for priests, seminarians, religious, and lay faithful. Tonight, Father Landry will lead us in a discussion on his new book, Plan of Life, Habits to Help You Grow Closer to God, and Outline Practices, or Habits, that will help you grow happier, holier, and closer to God every day. And with that, please join me in welcoming Father Roger Landry. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. Special thanks to Rosemary for that introduction and Father Charles and Mitch for the invitation to come here to the Catholic Information Center. I've only been here once before when Father Arnie had just basically come on in here and decorated it so well, and it's, it's a real honor to be able to come back. I see several friends in the audience, and I hope to make some new ones tonight. Plan of life. In almost every sphere of life, those who take something seriously come up with a plan. Championship sports teams like the Philadelphia Eagles. Flourishing businesses, triumphant political campaigns, and successful individuals all teach us collectively a powerful lesson. Those who get results generally are the ones with better strategies implemented with perseverance. That's true, too, of the spiritual life, which is too important to wing. So much of our happiness in this world and forever depends on whether we have a plan to respond to God's great plans for us, whether that plan is adequate to form us to become more and more like God, and whether we make and keep the commitment to follow that plan. The genesis of this book came ultimately out of what St. John Paul II wrote in his pastoral plan for the third Christian millennium. And none of us will outlive the third Christian millennium, so it pertains to all of us. It's called Nova Millennium Uniunte, as the new millennium is about to begin. He published it in January of 2001. And the crux of that pastoral plan was forming people to become saints. He said, I have no hesitation in saying that all pastoral initiatives, in other words, everything the church does, must be set in relation to holiness. It's necessary to rediscover the full practical significance of chapter 5 of the dogmatic constitution of the church, Lumen Gentium, dedicated to the universal call to holiness. Everyone's called to become holy as God is holy, perfected as the Father is perfect merciful as the Father is merciful, etc. He said, the council laid such stress on this point to make the call to holiness an intrinsic and essential aspect of its teaching on the church. To profess the church is holy means to point to her as Christ's bride for whom he gave himself to make her holy. This objective gift of holiness, he went on, is offered to all the baptized, but... The gift, in turn, becomes a task which has to shape the whole of Christian life. He continued by saying, it seems almost impractical to recall this elementary truth as the foundation for everything the church does. Because can holiness ever be planned? In chapter one of the book, I talk about the Holy Spirit because sanctification is pretty much the work of God. It's almost all God's work with which we cooperate, but we don't start it. 
Hans Urs von Balthasar had talked about that in his beautiful book on St. Therese, when he gave an image that so often we think that holiness is our activity, that we've got to climb up step by step a huge staircase with one holy action after another. He said St. Therese, who traveled to Rome in 1887 as a 14-year-old kid, right after the invention of elevators, looked at holiness in a totally different way, that rather than take the staircase all the way to the top of the building, God comes down in a lift and says, would you like a ride? <laughs> that holiness is primarily God's work, and so John Paul II asked, can holiness ever be planned? Can there be a plan of life leading us toward holiness? What would the word holiness mean in the context of a plan? But he said, to talk about holiness sorry, to talk about a plan under the heading of holiness is a choice filled with consequences. It implies the conviction that since baptism is an entrance into God's holiness through incorporation with Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, it would be a contradiction to settle for a life of mediocrity marked by a minimalist ethic and a shallow religiosity. To ask someone preparing to be baptized, do you wish to receive baptism, means do you wish to become holy, means to set before them the radical nature of the Sermon on the Mount, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. He said, this ideal of perfection can't be misunderstood as if it involves some kind of extraordinary existence, possible only for a few uncommon heroes of holiness. Think about St. Simeon Stylites up at the top of a 30 um, foot pedestal apart from everybody else or some of the great fasters or those who had lived tremendous lives of mortification he says this is not what the church means after commenting of how many people he had beatified and canonized from every walk of life he said the time has come to repropose wholeheartedly to everyone this high standard of ordinary Christian living the whole life of the Christian community and of Christian families must lead in this direction. It's clear, however, and this is the end, that the paths to holiness are personal and call for a genuine training in holiness adapted to people's needs. Training in holiness adapted to people's needs. The church has this rich treasure box of spiritual gifts and spiritual practices that can be adapted to people in their own individual circumstances. But today, many are unaware that they're heirs and heiresses of this extraordinary treasure. And that's one of the reasons why I wish to do this book. The second reason is because this training in holiness, this formation of people to become saints, also has huge consequences for the church and the world. I can't help but notice over here, got a statue of St. Josemaria Escriva, and he has a very famous saying that the crises that the world faces are crises of saints. The ultimate response that we need to have to the dilemmas of the day, God will give us, provided that we open ourselves up to those graces and respond. The church is struggling in many places. The world definitely needs the church in every society to be the salt, the light, and the leaven to which Jesus calls us. But for that to happen, we need to cooperate with what the Lord is doing. And that's the second reason for this book. There's a huge consequence of whether people have a plan to cooperate with God's plans because that's the means by which we're able to enter into the kingdom ourselves and help the world and the church resemble more and more those characteristics of the kingdom. Willing holiness, though, isn't enough. As St. Peter realized, much to his dismay on Holy Thursday night, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. We need something that can strengthen our frail flesh to align itself with our willing spirit. And the reality is that becoming like Jesus is the work of a lifetime. We need 
that genuine training and holiness adapted to our needs that John Paul II described. We need a game plan for the spiritual life. Priests have seminaries. After I graduated from Harvard, I had six years of specific formation of the priesthood. If somebody enters religious life, a young woman or a young man, they've got a year of postulancy, nine to 12 months, and two years of novitiate in which every behavior they have is under scrutiny to try to align it with what God would be asking through the particular constitution, through the particular charism given to that institute. The new realities that the Holy Spirit has raised up in the last century, from movements to personal prelatures, like the ancient third orders, all try to impart formation to their members to help them grow firm and withstand the various attacks against it. And once upon a time, most Catholics received the basic trainings of the faith in prayer and the life of virtue from their religious teachers in Catholic schools, from catechetical programs, from their parents and grandparents who were alumni of these spiritual boot camps. But as fewer young Catholics have been attending and fewer religious teaching in Catholic schools and religious education programs has been done well during the last couple of generations. The same type of practical wisdom that everyone needs just hasn't been getting sufficiently transmitted. And this has left many Catholics without the spiritual armor we need when our faith comes under attack. And without the know-how, better to grow in faith and pass it on, no matter whether it's an opportune or inopportune time. Information isn't enough. We need formation. Just like athletes need coaching, musicians need lessons, many professions need apprenticeships or residencies, Catholics need this training. And the church is a treasure trove of saint-making tips and spiritual practices. From the example of Jesus himself in scripture to the model of the early Christian saints and martyrs to the lives of canonized men and women from all walks of life, they show us ways to become more like Christ. St. Paul urged the young St. Timothy, train yourself in godliness. For while physical training is of value, godliness is valuable in every way, holding promise for the present life and the life to come. And St. Paul never failed to practice what he preached. He followed his own advice, telling the Corinthians, I don't run aimlessly. I don't box as fighting in the ear, but I punish my body and enslave it so that after proclaiming to others, I should myself not be disqualified. What he was talking about with his body, he was likewise talking about with his soul. St. John Paul II summed up the church's wisdom regarding attaining union with God by naming six pillars of the training in holiness. Grace, everything starts from God. Prayer, this faith and action in which we allow God into the reality of our life and examine it in his light. Sunday Mass, the little Easter for Christians. How can we really be a Christian without Easter? Confession, we are, as St. John Paul II used to say to young people, we see our weaknesses and are able to go to the Lord precisely to be strengthened in those weaknesses so that we might unite those areas of our life more and more to him hearing the word of God on every syllable of which man is supposed to live these words of eternal life and then passing it on as Pope Francis would indicate if we've really received the gospel at the level with which it should be received how can we keep it to ourselves? All of us, like St. Paul yesterday in the second reading at Sunday Mass, needs to feel within a little bit of that woe if we don't share the gospel. We've got to give birth to it once we've become impregnated with the word as God himself gives it to us through the conception in the ear. But we need not just to know about them, not just to do these six but to get the most we can out of them and integrate them into our daily lives. We must, with God's help, develop a curriculum of spiritual growth designed to grow little by little, day by day with God. This spiritual program is generally called a plan of life. In other places, it would be called a rule of life or a program of life. It's all the same reality. A game plan of spiritual exercises to help us learn how to fight the good fight 
run the race of life so as to win and keep the faith by growing in it and sharing it. It's a series of practices given to us by the saints and spiritual directors across the century to help us translate our desire to grow closer to God from vague aspiration to And in a secularist age, this is even more important. What's secularism? Pope Benedict used to define it as living seat deus non deretor, as if God were not a given. And those of us who would never be theoretical atheists, he said, can often become practical atheists by ordering the vast majority of our life like everybody else does, apart from God, except maybe a prayer at the beginning of the day or at the end, or visit on Sundays or at some other time. The remedy for this secularism <coughs> is to try to center our entire existence on the Lord, to live the moments of the day together with him, not just make him a part of our life, but the real core of our life, a plan of life is a regimen to help us keep the spiritual focus so that we might achieve true excellence in life, that excellence to which God has called us according to our circumstances. Matthew Kelly wrote the foreword for this book. Matt's a good friend, and I was really thinking about his demographic when I was putting a lot of this together. And Matt wrote, we think about achieving excellence in so many areas of our lives but when was the last time you reflected seriously on achieving true excellence in your spiritual life? How'd this work come together? It actually started as when I was doing my work as a parish priest in Fall River, Massachusetts. When I had gone to St. Bernadette's Parish, I was stunned, frankly, that most of the parishioners hadn't been to confession in 30 years. There were other issues there, too. That was just one symptom of a deeper problem. A lot of people were willing, it wasn't their fault, in most cases it wasn't their fault, that they weren't given what they have a right to. But I needed to start in a very elementary way, so having recruited some catechists to help me with the younger kids, we were trying to do a program for parents, and I was teaching between the masses, something for the parents and then something for the kids. And the kids, for 15 minutes before they'd go according to their individual grades, I would do a series on the sacraments, a series on the commandments, a series on certain of the virtues. All of those the kids got a little bit out of, but not all that much. I needed something for the next semester, so I said, let's try some of the aspects of what would be a typical plan of life. And that was the only one in which the parents who would normally have donuts and coffee started to come around to listen. I gave the talk on what's the second chapter here called the heroic minute, that when your alarm clock goes off, that's a huge battle, actually. If we can overcome our appetite for the snooze button, our appetite to give in to the cravings of the body for a little bit more rest and can get out of bed, that can redound to the way that we're able to discipline so many other appetites. And many of us snooze through life and not just early in the morning. And so I talked to the young kids from first grade to 10th grade in the CCD all at the same time about winning that battle this week. And the parents were all listening. The next week, many of the parents came back and said, I don't know how you did it, but I have been struggling my son's entire life getting him up when I go to wake him up. But he's now recognizing that this has something to do with God, and so he was springing out of bed each day. And they started paying attention to the other aspects of the plan of life. And what so many of them said, sadly, was that they never heard of practices like the angels. Some hadn't heard of the rosary. Some had never really been invited to adoration and didn't quite know what it meant even though we started perpetual adoration at the parish. The, when they heard the word, they just didn't really grasp what the reality was that was being offered to them. So over the course of time, they started to take it seriously. Even some of their, their kids tried to act on this little by little, part by part. <coughs> then I was assigned to work for the Holy See's mission to the United Nations, and it's very strange that anybody who would work 
um, for as an official for the Holy See in any department would have a public personality. Normally, the only one who has a public personality is the head, right? In my case, the nuncio, Archbishop Bowes of the United Nations. But my bishop in the Diocese of Fall River wanted me to continue to write for the newspaper that I was editing. And so I needed to find something that I could write about that would not be controversial, lest the superiors of my superior over in Rome were saying, what is this guy writing when anything that he writes could make a headline saying, Holy See official says blank. And so I said, listen, I don't think anybody's going to shut down a series on spiritual practices like how to pray the rosary better. And so started right there and developed the series, got a lot of feedback. And at the very end of that series, which was a full year in 2015, I got an email from the Daughters of St. Paul. Sister Mary Gray said that, listen, this series, Father, addresses a very needed topic in an interesting and practical way. Many Catholics desire today to understand and live the basics of the spiritual life in order to grow in their faith and friendship with Jesus and their ability to share the fruits of this faith with others. We think a collection on the plan of life would make a great book. So I'm writing to inquire whether you would be interested in working with us to edit them into a book. I thought it would be relatively easy. It was actually very hard work but I learned a little bit about what contractions must be like for pregnant women as this firstborn book was finally and arduously brought to birth. What's in the book? It's rather simple. It's broken down into a couple sections. First the basics and then what I call beyond the basics. I tried to write about things that everyone could do. After an introductory chapter on why we should never seek stop seeking to grow closer to God, the book is broken down into these basics. So openness to the Holy Spirit. He is the guide of the soul. And if we're ever going to grow more and more like God, it's going to be his work. So we need to start there. Lest we um, live that early heresy of the church called Pelagianism, that we're saved fundamentally by our own actions, rather than saved by God, which we receive and then cooperate with. So start with how much the Holy Spirit has been sent to us precisely to help us to grow, to teach us how to pray because we don't know how to pray as we ought, as St. Paul says. But he fills us with the capacity to recognize that we are true sons and daughters of God who can cry out, Abba, Father. St. Augustine said the Holy Spirit teaches us how to pray not by quid oris, what you say as you pray, but qualis oris, who you are, how you are, what are your characteristics as you pray. You're meant to pray as beloved sons and daughters who know that their father won't give them a stone when they ask for a loaf of bread or a poisonous eel when they ask for a fish. Holy Spirit helps us in daily life. That's what life according to the Holy Spirit means. He helps us spread the faith, giving us words that we don't ourselves have especially when we're under duress. So we start with God. It's curious that when Jesus encourages us to pray, saying that whatever you ask the Father, the Father will hear, and says no matter what you ask, he will give you the Holy Spirit. God always responds to our prayer by giving himself. He gives us the Holy Spirit precisely to help us to grow. Next we get to that heroic moment, as I said, that first big battle of the day, it gets harder, I think, as we go along. It's certainly harder in the winter. I put in a lot of techniques to be able to live that well, from putting your alarm clock on the opposite side of the room to letting the alarm clock still sound if you're in a circumstance where it can until you put cold water on your face or made your bed or whatever else. But it's an important battle to win because it helps us against our appetite so that they don't dominate us, but we control them. After that, the morning offering, which is the time in which we offer our entire day and our life to God. Pope Benedict used to cite two passages of sacred scripture more than any other. One was John 12, 24, which is, unless we follow Jesus in going the way of the grain of wheat, we won't bear fruit. But then the other was Romans 12, 1. 
brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord, your logike latreia, your logical worship, or best translated, the only worship that makes sense, is to offer your bodies, and your body is a sacrament of who you are, body and soul, offer yourselves to God. And the great saints have always counseled to offer ourselves at the beginning of the day so that we can start off each day as if it were Mass to live it as a liturgy of the hours. I have some of the saints' suggestions in there. St. John Vianney, St. John Paul II, some of the others to help nourish that. If you already have the practice, maybe some of their insights will help as well. Daily prayer. One of the most important things we do if God is really God in our life, will we make time for him? The analogy I always used in the parish is if Pope Francis or Pope Benedict or Pope John Paul II were to call you, would you take the phone call? If he wanted to meet with you for 10, 15 minutes to talk about your spiritual life, most of us would readily cancel our other appointments to do it. And then I would always ask, well, what about the Pope's boss? Would we make the time for God? Loves us more than anything else. A lot of the times we find ourselves so busy. Fulton J. Sheen used to have a saying, when you say that you're too busy for a holy hour, he says, then you need two holy hours. If you've got that much important work that you're doing. I kind of likewise appreciate very much what Matthew Kelly counsels. As you know, He says that the real choice that we have to make is, even if we are really busy, a working single mom with everything that's going on. Can you stop for a solid minute, block everything else out, remember that God is alive and he's with you, and again, reinvigorate that conversation. Any of us can do it for a minute. But Mad's genius is, it's a much bigger step for, um, for, for us to go from zero to one minute than it is to go from one to five, or 5 to 15, or 15 to 60, but to just make that time for the Lord. Sacred Scripture. We Catholics, as the surveys show, know Sacred Scripture very, very poorly. Uh, Protestant brothers and sisters put us to shame. What a pity. We believe and profess that this is the word of eternal life, that it is God who speaks to us here. And to make extra time to get to know what God is saying is a crucial means by which we can think as God thinks, speak as God speaks. During the Synod on the Word of God and the Life and the Mission of the Church, which happened in 2008, there was a bishop from Latvia. His name was uh, Bishop Victor Utz, no, sorry, Anton Utz. Um, and he told the story of a Father Victor who was one of his clergy of that diocese. And when the communists came into Latvia, they confiscated the various books, threw the Bible on the ground, and were making the priests, in order to stay out of jail, stomp on sacred scripture. When they came to Father Victor's, he went down and he kissed the word of God. And for that, he was sent for 10 years to Siberia. At the end of his 10 years, he came out he was totally emaciated. Everybody could see that he had aged about 40 years in that decade. And he came to celebrate Mass. And at the end of proclaiming the Gospel, he held up the Evangeliarium, the Book of the Gospels. And he just said, Verbum Domini. And Bishop Hugh said, everybody just wept for 10 minutes because they knew how much he valued the Word of God. St. Jerome said in the fourth century that we have a great love for the Eucharist, and if we saw by accident that a priest in celebrating Mass knocked over a host onto the floor but didn't know, or even a particle of the host, most of us Catholics would immediately act out of our reverence for the Word made flesh. He says, but many of us don't have the same impression when the word of God is proclaimed, we're very happy to let the word fall on hardened soil. 
Sacred Scripture is so important for us to continue to grow, to align ourselves to God's great plan for us. Focus on the importance of Sunday. Not just Mass on Sunday, which is crucial, but there's a spirituality of Sunday. St. John Paul II wrote about it in 1998 in a beautiful, in a beautiful exhortation called Dies Domini, that this really is the day of the Church. It's a reset button that God gives us to reorder everything. It's one of the commitments that's actually explained why God gave it to us. And at first it sounds like a non sequitur. Remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. For you were once slaves in Egypt. Doesn't seem like those two things go together. Except if we're not living the Sabbath as it ought to be lived. We're enslaved to something. If we don't have adequate time for God and for charity on the day of the Lord... We're probably enslaved to something else. Maybe to work or what work allows us to be able to purchase, even for our loved ones, good things, but not quite as good as God. Maybe it's to the chores, maybe it's to the work around the house, maybe it's to football or some other sport or some other hobby. But the Lord's Day is key if we're going to genuinely have that reset. Jesus calls us to yoke ourselves to him, and Sunday is a great way, freed from the other pressures in which we're able to get right what's most important. Confession. The great saints have always recommended frequent confession. Pope Francis has been repeating this with his 81-year-old vocal cords, reminding all of us that he goes twice a month. JP2 used to go once a week. And their souls aren't necessarily the souls of serial killers, <laughs> right? In the book, I describe the teachings of the church about the fruits that come from fre frequent confession. But it's an extraordinary way to grow, to become more and more like God, is we're bathed regularly in his mercy. And through those sacramental graces, allow our soul to go back to the splendor it had on the day of its baptism. Adoration. Pope Francis calls adoration an idol crusher. Bob Royal is here, and we were on live that mass for the Conclave crew for EWTN back on March 14th, 2013, when Pope Francis was celebrating his first mass as Pope from the Sistine Chapel. And I was doing the simultaneous translation. We didn't have a copy of the text because he didn't have a text. He was going from his heart, or as they say in Italian, a braccio from his arms. And he got to a point in the homily where he said, chi non prega Dio prega il diavolo. And I couldn't believe it, and I looked over in Bob's direction on the other side of the set as I'm mouthing out these words, because I, did he really say this? The one who isn't praying to God is praying to the devil. That's what Pope Francis was saying, echoing the French intellectual Léon Blois. But his whole approach to adoration is precisely that. When we get down on our knees before Jesus in the Holy Eucharist, we relativize everything else we're doing. When I had started perpetual adoration in my parish, I was asking for one hour a week, one out of 168. If you can't give a whole hour, a half hour. And if we can't find that type of time for God, it's probably a good sign that we've got our priorities a little out of whack because some, we do find time for lots of other things that we would recognize are not quite as important as that. Charity. What I stress in this chapter on charity as an essential aspect, a basic of our life, is we will be judged on whether we love God, not which is some of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, but all our mind, heart, soul, and strength and love our neighbor with all we've got as well. And if it's that important to the Lord and to us, it can't just be left to random acts of kindness. If it's this important, we've got to plan it. Yes, random acts of kindness are great. Those spontaneous acts of generosity are beautiful. But our life of charity can't just remain at that level. But the more we plan our charity, think about those who need it. And I'm not just talking money here precisely talking about the gift of ourselves to others. That's when 
our life begins to get more and more harmonized with the Lord. I focus on the importance of Holy Week. Many times on Palm Sunday, people say to me, and I still have never really been able to adjust to it, they say, see you next Sunday, Father. Just like, how about Holy Thursday when <laughs> Jesus came? How about Good Friday? If somebody that you loved was on his deathbed, wouldn't you come? Wouldn't you come? Come on, come on. How about the most beautiful Mass of the entire year in which all of salvation history is resumed? The Easter Vigil. You know, sometimes people just haven't been challenged to make that week the holiest week of their year and really reorder their schedule as much as possible to live those moments. And the last of these chapter in the basics was on the Holy Rosary, which is the great prayer that makes saints. It's a liturgy no matter where we are. And the beauty of the rosary is we know how long it generally takes. It's got a structure that brings us to meditate the, on the essential mysteries of Christ's life through the contemplative heart of his mother. We can learn in that means to begin to center our life on the blessed fruit of Mary's womb. And it transforms us over the course of time. It teaches us a rhythm of prayer. This is what's made so many saints. John Paul II's insistence on the rosary helped a priest from Argentina, a Jesuit who uh, had come to Rome when he prayed with John Paul II at the Grotto of Our Lady of Lourdes in the Vatican Gardens, just said, I have to make the rosary a greater priority in my own life. And that young Jesuit, Father Jorge Bergoglio, became Pope Francis. And he continues to ask everybody, especially at World Youth Days, to take up that spiritual weapon of the rosary because it does transform us. So those were the basics that I had covered. In the Beyond the Basics, I talked about Eucharistic practices like daily mass and spiritual communion. You know, the most important decision I ever made was when I was a freshman in college at Harvard. It was September, that it was the first month of college, and uh, I didn't get to Harvard for nothing. I said, is there anything more important than receiving God on a Monday? Could there be anything else more important than receiving on a Tuesday or a Wednesday or a Thursday, etc.? And I said, no, there wouldn't be. Objectively, that's the most important thing that happens anywhere in the world on any given day. And I give God credit for this because he was the one who saved my life driving across seas, on going to Martha's Vineyard because there were no daily masses on Saturdays on Cape Cod once, driving a hundred down Route 81 in Pennsylvania to get to Wilkes-Barre because they were the only mass on a given Saturday, but not, and without a ticket, and these types of things. But from that day in 1988 until this day, I have never gone one day without Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. And I think that that's one of the reasons why I'm a priest. It's one of the reasons for my zeal. It's because it all starts with God. It's a beyond the basic practice because not everybody can do it because of mass schedules, because of family and work schedules and everything else. But what a beautiful thing it is when we can live that Eucharistic life. But when we can't, spiritual communions, and I talk about the importance of uniting ourselves to what God is giving us on that Mass, because he himself is not bound by the sacraments he himself instituted. Talk about Marian devotions, like living Saturdays well, or praying the Angelus, or Regina Chaley, or Memorare. That Angelus, where we focus on the incarnation of the Lord, that God really has come into our world. And when we just stop for a little bit at noon in the middle of the day and focus on that, it begins to help us to recognize that God with us is still with us throughout the rest of the day. Penitential practices, very out of vogue today, but like fasting or other forms of mortification, how important it is so that we're able to keep our appetites in check, but also so that we can begin to hunger for what God really hungers. Two chapters on unity of life, bringing everything together, describing the importance of organization and order, the particular exam in which we find one thing we need to work on and insistently focus on it and build the habit so that we acquire that virtue or lose that vice, the importance of our work and learning how to pray it, study, and allowing God to help us zealously to learn what we need in order to be able to serve him better, spiritual reading, retreats and recollections, 
and a final chapter on Christian attitudes of the heart, the types of aspirations we pray, and the fruit of all of it, joy. Some friends have asked me about a couple of what they call the kune in the book, things that should have been in there but didn't make the cut. One was the Liturgy of the Hours. Why didn't I put Liturgy of the Hours in as even a beyond the basics practice? I've prayed the Liturgy of the Hours for 25 years and love it. I find it extraordinarily helpful, especially when prayed liturgically in common. But I avoided in this book putting in things that I thought would be difficult for people to do or to learn. One can't do everything. And if we're going to choose about where we're going to dedicate some of our limited time, I thought it was more important to stress mental prayer than vocal prayer. And for praying meditatively on sacred scripture, rather than reciting, for example, sacred scripture, the Psalms and small little passages from the Old or New Testament in the vocal prayer, the Liturgy of the Hours. Praying the Liturgy of the Hours fruitfully requires a lot of work, and I made a call to urge energies and direction that I thought would help even more. And the second was about spiritual erection. Um, one young guy in New York wrote, and he said that he loved the book, but he was really buying it and reading it because he thought I would give great indications about spiritual direction, which would help him. I think spiritual direction's very important. St. Bernard of Clairvaux said, well before the comment was adapted to lawyers, that the one who guides himself has a fool for a directee. But as much as I wish the situation were otherwise, it's just very hard for most people to find competent directors if they don't live in metropolises like New York or Washington. Relatively few parish priests take on directees, mostly because they know how time-consuming it is and don't have that time to set up regular appointments with dozens of parishioners for this type of one-on-one -on -one guidance. Some priests, likewise, have had bad experiences with it when people basically come to, list, to have someone listen to their spiritual insights because they think they're the next St. Faustina Kowalska or St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, where all that is really happening is God's given a light in prayer, as he does normally when we do mental prayer well. And they need a little bit of help to understand it. But likewise, some other experiences have been that some people come to see priests and so that they can tell everybody else that so-and-so, Father so-and-so is my spiritual director, so that that gives them a green light to criticize the other priests of the diocese or the other Catholic women in the book club because Father so-and-so is, is their spiritual director. And so I did not want to send people on discouraging wild goose chases, looking for spiritual directors when the ordinary candidates that they'd ask might not be able to respond. Um, One-on-one -on -one spiritual direction is very important, but the last thing I wanted to do was set it up as something where people might start looking to find someone but actually discover no one, or someone who, when this does happen today, will shamefully charge them for spiritual direction, or others who on occasion might be blind guides. So let's just wrap up. The whole mission of the church, as I mentioned, is to help people become more and more like Jesus, to become saints. Jesus himself said in the Sermon on the Mount, no disciple is superior to the teacher, but when fully trained, every disciple will be like his teacher. In the plan of life, there are some steps, not all of them, it's not exhaustive, but some <coughs> steps to help us to become more and more like that teacher. <coughs> who shows us the way to eternal life. Thanks very much for your attention. We have about 33 minutes, I think, for questions. If you have any questions, just raise your hand and I'll come to you with the mic. So somebody can break the ice and maybe we'll take three questions at a time like we do at the UN. Okay. Thank <laughs> Thank you, Father Landry, for your uh, talk. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about um, that last chapter, uh, attitudes of the heart, um, and sort of practices that you might associate uh, with that. I'm thinking in particular about 
uh, humility and joy. Thank you. Are there other questions? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Christopher McAvoy from uh, Centerville, Virginia. Um, I would wonder if you could uh, offer your opinion as to uh, to what extent uh, the visitations of uh, monasteries, priories uh, of people in the religious life could potentially offer uh, a profound holy example uh, for people. Do you have any opinion on, on that and how parishes might interconnect more with the local religious uh, communities? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My name is Raphael. Yes, well, one question about any advice about uh, avoiding falling in mechanic practices or some kind of like automaticity in which we are doing these practices but we're not really feeling them. Great. And you mentioned that it's good to offer ourselves to God completely, but the issue of what about if we are still in, we feel that we are sinful in one way or another, is there a right time to offer ourselves to God or we wait until we have changed our ways before offering ourselves? Okay. Thanks. Very good questions. Attitudes of the heart. What I tried to do there, it's a title that grouped in a lot of means by which we're trying to get to the tree that produces good fruit, right? So humility is what St. Bernard said is by far the most important of all the virtues. When he was asked to list the three most important ones, he said, humilitas, humilitas, humilitas. That's how important it is. What is humility? It comes from humus, dirt, right, the ground. It's being firmly rooted in reality. And so there are two realities. First, that we are dirt. That's what Adam means. But dirt in which God blew in the breath of life. And so we're vessels of clay, but containing within a treasure. And so humility both means, first, that we see the various ways that we're not like God, but in, in another way that we are so grateful for the treasures that God has given us. I think the most humble prayer of all time sounds like one of the most bragging prayers in sacred scripture, which is Mary's Magnificat. Imagine if I were to come on out tonight and say, my soul magnifies the Lord. You know, come on, it sounds a little uh, presumptuous. My spirit rejoice in God, my Savior. All generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, etc. But it was true. It was absolutely true. And the Blessed Mother um, harmonized so many of the sayings of the great heroines of the Old Testament and recognized how they all applied to her. And so she had tremendous humility, which opens us up to exactly what God wants to give. Because one, we don't think that we deserve it. But at the same time, in his generosity, he gives it, so it fills us with greater thanksgiving. But at the same time, we recognize just how much we need it. And that we are that fruitful soil that takes in that seed and bears great fruit because we see the greatness of the gift that we never take for granted. Joy I finished with at the very end because it really is the fruit of everything. Jesus came and he said, I want my joy to be in you and your joy to be complete. Jesus came smiling. You know, so many of our images of Jesus are like Robert Powell and Jesus of Nazareth from 1978. I don't know how any man would ever want to follow Robert Powell's depiction of Jesus. But if you ever see Bruce Marchiano's depiction of Jesus in the visual Bible of St. Matthew, watch him on the Sermon on the Mount. None of the ac other actors in that depiction are any good, but Jesus is the best. And I love Jim Caviezel's portrayal. But Marchiano's even better because Marchiano showed the extraordinary joie de vivre of Jesus. And he wants us to have that joy. Pope Francis wrote his first exhortation on joy and he said, so many of us live the faith as if we're constantly coming back from a funeral or it, every day is Good Friday. He says, it's got to be different than that. And God wants joy to be that fruit of the Holy Spirit. 
right? So when the Holy Spirit is really abiding in us and acting, joy is one of the consequences of it. A joy that the world doesn't give and can't rob, a joy that goes beyond just waking up on the right side of the bed or having a good meal with some great wine or anything else like this. There's a profound spiritual joy that could even lead St. Paul to say, I rejoice in suffering because he recognizes that he's with the Lord. Where does joy come from? Just joy comes first from a vivid awareness of the presence of God. Kyrie K. Keratomene. Rejoice, you who have been filled with grace. The Lord is with you. It comes from that reality of God's being with us in all times. Monasteries and priories. Pope Benedict used to say that every believer needs the oasis of a monastery. Even if they can't actually get there, what a monastery stands for is that God is still present in the middle even of the desert, right? And the desertification of spirituality in the middle of the world has a remedy. When he was at the Collège des Bernardins uh, in 2008 in Paris, he gave one of his extraordinary September discourses. One was in Regensburg, the other was at Westminster, but this was in the middle of those. And what he said was that the monks show us all one of the most important things in human life, which is querere deum, what it means to seek God. Their whole life is about that search for God. Most people, when they think about Monks and cloistered nuns think that they've already found God and been found by God and that it's some type of a static and boring existence. But he says exactly the opposite. They're going out there because they have an insatiable hunger for God and that's where they've been led to find him evermore. And that querere deum that we learn from the cloistered contemplatives, for example, that needs to influence our life. Because a lot of the times we're satisfied by far lesser goods than the greatest good of all. And so he, um, he points us to their holy example because in every one of our circumstances, it's the one who seeks, who finds the Lord, and he wants us all to seek more. Parishes, I, I, unfortunately, not every parish is close to a monastery or a cloistered convent. It, in those areas where... Um, where monasteries and convents are available, and we are, frankly, they think with the church, they pray with the church, they do these well. It's an extraordinary resource to let go to waste, and I encourage everyone to get out there, but don't necessarily wait for priests to book a bus and take the whole parish. To the extent that God's given you the ability to drive and a GPS, you can search for the monastery and find it yourself. Raphael's question. Um, When we, so all of us are sinners. None of us, I think, is the Blessed Virgin Mary. So when we make our self-offering, we're not even going to have total self-mastery. There are parts of us that we don't yet fully own, but that we're striving to do it. And there are also parts of us that we would be filled with shame about, those areas in which we would have sinned. It's an extraordinary thing still to offer ourselves and our weakness and even our sins to God. And not in a sort of blasphemous way, but Christ on the cross paid the price to take away all our sins. So when we make an offering in which we're offering even our sins, we're giving him what he paid that precious price to obtain. And so holding nothing back, we give ourselves as we are. And one of the most important things, I think, in praying well is not to strive to pray as you ought to pray, because a lot of the times, then it's just not sincere. But when we go and say, Lord, I am a mess. I don't even know what we're doing. I'm doing. In some ways, we're already praying very, very well when, when we do that. Your first question I didn't write down, avoiding practice. Uh, do you remember? Oh, thank you. Yeah, so there's a good sense of forming routine habits in our life that can sustain us. 
but at the same time, we can go too far in such a way that we're no longer thinking about what we're doing. And so I think that what's, especially with the vocal prayers, the principle of St. Benedict, when he was instructing his fellow Benedictines how to pray the Liturgy of the Hours well, uh, obtains. And the principle is mens concordat voci, which means the mind or the soul and the heart, but your interior ought to align itself with what you're actually saying. So you slow down enough to think about what you're saying and mean it. When we pray the rosary, sometimes it starts with just pausing. John Paul II said, before you start a decade of the rosary, pause for a second, remember what you're doing, remember the mystery, ask for help to do it well, and then embark. But those little few second pauses where we remember what our intentionality is, it's key to prevent the bad side of routinization. But there is that good side in which it forms our habits that even when we don't feel like it, we do it anyway. Eventually, like anybody who's ever worked out physically, uh, then you're actually going to feel like doing it at a given day. But the very fact that you've been doing it routinely for such a long time allows you to build so much more easily than what's true for physical exercises, I think, is likewise true for spiritual exercises. I think we can take a few more if there are. Father, my name is Charles McLaughlin. So you mentioned the Magnificat prayer. My, my question is about the little Magnificat booklet mm -hmm. and uh, what your opinion of it is. Um, I've used it for about a year and found it extraordinarily helpful. The, uh, but sometimes when I'm talking to others who give me advice, they might say, oh, that's me to put that aside and do, do other things. So uh, the utility of that little publication. Okay, great. Back row. Uh, yeah, I, I heard you talking about like making Saturdays special in a kind of Marian way, and I never heard that before, so I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Sure. So, confession, the victory minute, uh, some of these things when you were walking a congregation through... Uh, Catechesis 101 that hadn't experienced some of these things in 30 years. Um, what did you find most helpful, other than what you've shared so far, about helping them take the first step towards that? Mm -hmm. And to what extent do you honestly think that um, a curious Protestant who is seeking rigorous um, excellence or more discipline in their spiritual life could pick up your book and gain some real um, nuggets from it to incorporate into their practice? Okay, thank you for those questions. My experience with Magnificat is that it is the most accessible resource out there to help new Catholics gain a liturgical sensibility and to help Catholics who want to respond to a desire implanted with them to grow but don't exactly know what the next step is. Magnificat gives them that. What I love about Magnificat is Magnificat merges very effectively veritas et pulchritudo, truth and beauty. You know, the covers of Magnificat, all of which deserve to be framed, right? I mean, it starts every day you're looking at something. You're looking at the beauty of the faith. And then on the inside, they choose very well the commentaries and other things that are placed there because there's a beauty in language, there's a beauty in insight, but it just constantly shows the beauty of the faith. I have given the Magnificat to many who were thinking about becoming Catholic. And Magnificat is a, an extraordinarily effective fishing hook. Because once they start, and you know, the Magnificat really isn't the liturgy of the hours in the same way, but it has uh, same more or less general outline of what happens with uh, morning prayer and evening prayer, etc. It takes you to the Mass. The, the little commentaries on Sacred Scripture, I think, are very helpful. Um, I think the criticism that you'd hear every once in a while to Magnificat would be that Magnificat isn't everything, but I think it's an extraordinary resource and I highly recommend it. And I say that not just because I've written for Magnificat many times, <laughs> but I really do believe it. Um, Saturdays. So in the early church, 
Saturdays were considered the second most important day. This was the day of Mary, the greatest disciple of all, who wants to breastfeed us on her own faith so that we can center our life more and more around her son. So we, the, the early church had all of these little offices of Our Lady that people would pray, special devotions to Our Lady on Saturday, etc. The early church really took this Mary dimension of the faith seriously. Unfortunately, after the Second Vatican Council, there was a crisis in authentic Marian spirituality. Um, a little bit because of the excesses of previous days in which, you know, in some places, if you had Eucharistic adoration, you had Jesus on the altar, and somebody said, sorry, I don't mean to scandalize anybody, but Mary's appearing in a tree across the street. You'd have a lot of people leave Jesus in the Eucharist to go look at the bark across the street. And so that's excessive, right? It's excessive. So there was a little bit of a reaction to that, but for the most part, I think that there was a loss of faith uh, with regard to the Marian dimension of the church. And so what happened? When I was preparing to be a priest, uh, Archbishop Sheen had a great influence on me, his writings and everything else. You know, he made a promise as he was preparing to be a priest that every Saturday of his life would celebrate a Mass for Our Lady. And I made the same commitment. Some days you can't, it's the solemnity of St. Peter and Paul. But on every day that you can, uh, every Saturday that you can to live this. And I was kind of shocked at how rare in a lot of places even Saturday Masses are. <coughs> so if priests themselves aren't growing in their Marian devotion, a lot of the times it's going to be very difficult to pass that on to their people. And so this, we, you know, Mary, uh, John Paul II, <coughs> when he was about your age, his 20s, um, he was similarly going through a questioning about whether his devotion to Mary might be a little disordered with regard to the bigger sort of questions of the faith. And he said, St. Louis Marie Grignon de Montfort's treatise of true devotion to Our Lady really helped him a great deal to see that Mary always leads us to Christ provided that we relive her mystery in Christ. It's not automatic. But to relive Mary's mystery in Christ, the mystery of a disciple, the mystery of a mother. You know, St. Ambrose said in the early church that even though Christ only had one mother according to his flesh, he's supposed to have many mothers according to the faith. And what he meant by that is when we hear the word of God and conceive it through our ear, become impregnated by it, it begins to grow so that finally we have no choice but as the Spanish and Portuguese say, to give it to the light. Right, to give birth. So there's a process very similar to the maternity that Mary exercised, and this is his interpretation of the one who hears the word of God and acts on it is my mother and my brother and my sister. And so there's a particular sort of Marian dimension to all of this. The other Marian practices, there's been traditional sort of special mortifications to Mary on Saturday to unite yourself to her on Holy Saturday as she's awaiting the resurrection. So the particular way that her heart was pierced and um, wounded in a holy way on Holy Saturday, that's what Marian devotion on Saturday likewise leads to. Um, when Mary came down in Fatima 101 years ago, she asked for the devotion of first Saturdays, which is really quite significant at the same time. And to the extent that we believe that that um, apparition's authentic, it's, it really doesn't follow that we would believe that Mary really came down and asked for something, but then not really act on it and take it seriously. And so get into that a lot uh, with the other Marian practices too on Saturday. One great way to live it is to just pray a Salve Regina or some other special prayer every Saturday, but to the extent that there are Masses available, I'd strongly urge people to go to Mass on Saturday out of love for Our Lady. Um, Confession in heroic moment, uh, what was most helpful in bringing that to uh, the parishes? My approach, whenever anything would be controversial in a parish, is um, rather than easily get into the frame where they're judging my predecessors versus me and guessing who really is in line with what the Catholic faith is, my approach always 
is to try to describe the experiences um, of people who have received the fruits well. So in confession, more than anything else, I try every second Sunday of Advent when it's John the Baptist <laughs> about it, and you get to the fourth Sunday of Lent, the parable of the prodigal son to preach about it. It didn't have much impact. Those who had a tremendous trust for their priests would try it out, etc. But the, about a year in, there was a really strong man in my parish. Incredible hope light. <laughs> now, early 50s, but I mean, you, you're just an imposing, tough guy. He came to me in the sacristy. And I thought he was going to say that his wife had just died. But he was really emotional. And he said, Father, I just have to tell you something. He said, sure, man. He said, you know, you have been bugging the crap out of me, just the way you phrased it, ever since you got here, about going to confession. So finally, I just gave in, and I was up at La Salette Shrine yesterday, and I went to confession for the first time in many, many, many years. And I just feel like I totally know that. I don't know how to thank you. I said, I'll show you how you're going to He said, I don't understand. So I grabbed him by the tie. I just said, I'm not going to drag you by the tie. We walk, it's about 1025 for the 1030 Mass. We walk straight down to the pulpit. And I say, sorry to interrupt your prayer, everybody, but Ed Hayes has something he wants to say. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, Ed just kind of looks at me. It's just like, Ed, you asked. This is the way you can thank me. So he just, he's not a public speaker. He's very sincere and down to earth, but a tough, tough guy who just basically says, you were probably all as bugged and angry as I have been that Father Landry always mentions going to confession. Well, finally I gave in. And I went yesterday. It's the greatest choice I've ever made in my life. And then he looks at me and he says, is that okay? <laughs> and I said, I just leaned into the microphone and I said, confessions will be offered Monday for three days if anybody would like. And to believe it or not, I, it's one of the most touching experiences of my priesthood, actually. Probably in my first year and a half there, out of all my parishioners, probably fewer than a hundred had come at any one time. That day after, it started to reverberate all the way around. That day after, I had 150. I was texting my brother priests across the city, just saying, can you just come on over? I couldn't believe how many people there were there because there's nothing like a happy customer to show from a subjective point of view what would come. And so that is normally the way that I approached everything and approached both of these. The heroic moment is a simple little practice. Uh, I talk about the fruits of it. Most people are able to pick that up because most people struggle a little bit uh, with it and they know that it would bear a little bit of fruit. Um, and in terms of curious Protestants, uh, what nuggets would be in here? My hope in this book would be first that they, through the chapter on sacred scripture, would recognize that I seem almost Protestant on my love of sacred scripture. So maybe a kindred spirit even there. To try to see at least how Catholics understand what Catholics do. And what I've tried in this book is to integrate it within the whole of our discipleship, right, of our real following Jesus. To try to take things back as uh, radio spokes to the center who is Jesus, uh, that all of these flow from Jesus in a particular way. That's what at least I hope. A few Protestants have read it um, and have told me that they very much liked particularly the chapters that I thought would be most Catholic. So what was the chapter that they liked the most? The two were Mary and the Eucharist. Because it was a Catholic attempt to try to explain some of the types of things which are obstacles for them. So you know, I hope that those will be bridges for them to come. Is that Thank it? Thank you, Father Roger. Okay. Great. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, we're able to host such great speakers and start meaningful conversations around issues facing everyday Catholics because of your continued presence and support, so thank you. Um, I'd like to also thank Father Roger for making the trip down from New York and sharing your insights on how we can reset our lives with Christ for Christ. 
If you like tonight's event, I'd encourage you to visit our website at CICDC.org and check out our amazing event lineup. This week on Thursday, we have a great event with Craftsman John McCarthy. Um, you can come and see him talk about what it's like behind the scenes of his woodworks and discuss the inspiration that um, moves him to make these beautiful works of art. Um, I'd invite you to stay for the reception that will go until 8 p.m. And Father Roger will be available to sign copies of his book. Thank you again for coming. Thank you.